Okay, I'm ready to get started whenever y'all are ready. All right, uh, I think I'm introducing Students Fighting Climate Change for whoever is unfamiliar with our organization. Um, our mission statement is um, we strive to create an inclusive, positive community for climate action, to give people hope and to humanize one another as we face the climate crisis. Um, and the pillars that um, SFCC upholds is first environmental and social justice in everything that we do institutional accountability and action. You guys will hear a lot about that um, as we get into the divestment movement and in the ways that SFCC has been acting on that and, and also education empowerment. So um, that's things like putting on webinars and um, general meetings like this where we inform um, our community um, and empower each other to act and make change. Um, so we have some social medias um, that you guys can look to to get more involved and then also a QR code to access our Google Calendar where we have all of our meetings with our Zoom links and um, external events, internal events and everything else that we like to advertise. So that's a little bit about SFCC. Hi, uh, my name is Serena. I am one of the co-leads for the Environmental Justice Collective, um, and I'm just here to introduce what EJC is. Um, EJC is a group, um, I guess a collective, you could say, <laughs> by our name, um, under the Campus Environmental Center, um, which is actually the oldest environmental org at UT. Um, and But the Environmental Justice Collective actually started pretty recently um, in the fall of 2018. It started off with um, a group of students of color who wanted to see more environmental justice education on campus, as well as um, more opportunities to learn about environmental advocacy. And so we're here, 2021, on Zoom, unfortunately, and not making zines on prison abolition. <laughs> um, but we're still uh, continuing our mission to um, educate students on issues under environmental justice, which includes divestment, which is why we're here today, and um, sort of bring to the forefront, um, you know, that you too can be leaders um, in the environmental justice movement. Um, so yeah, and we do have a lot of events scheduled for the coming semester. Um, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook <laughs> um, at UTEJ Collective or email us at justice at utenvironment.org. Um, and we do have two components to our project. Um, one component is education slash advocacy, which is um, kind of an example of this is this presentation right now. And another component is curriculum. So Shri Kri can probably speak a little bit more to that. If you're Yeah, so <laughs> our goals of curriculum are to make UT's cur uh, curriculum more inclusive and particularly um, talking about the foundations of social justice. And so the way we're doing this is we're trying to highlight courses that are already offered at UT by our amazing professors. And we are working with faculty and as well as members of SFCC just to um, push for curriculum change. Yeah, so it's a pretty big, um, I guess, project. And we do have sort of vision for the coming years. Um, we were funded by Green Fund. We should note that. Um, so basically what the Green Fund is, is just a small amount of money taken out from each of y'all's tuition to that gets pulled into um, a big old grant sort of situation. Um, and students can apply for that money if um, they have um, some sort of sustainability related project that they would like to see on campus. And EJC is one of those. Um, and yeah, pretty much it. Okay, sorry, that's me. Um, 
Hi, I am Sydney. I am the co-director for Education Campaign uh, alongside Ella. Um, I'm just going to get started. Um, so we are taking a deep dive into divestment, um, which if you guys can read, <laughs> is the process of demanding an institution to sell off unethical business investments and assets, often those relating to harmful industries like fossil fuels. Um, so there are divestment movements going on all over the world. Um, there have been successful ones at other college campuses that we will also be highlighting and talking about in the presentation. Um, and yeah, that's the basis of what divestment is. We'll get into the um, history um, later and success stories, and I will just pass it off to my next speaker. Um, really quick logistical thing. I'm, I'm sorry to do this, um, but it turns out that there are a lot of people asking to get into the presentation. Um, would, do you think we should pause the recording to like restart the meeting to wait for that or continue going? Sorry to bring this up in the middle. No, that's totally fine. I mean, we haven't really done anything, so we can pause and then we can would everyone, I think. Is... I, I was going to know, I can um, probably stick the recordings together if we do upload it to YouTube or when we do upload it to YouTube. Um, so yeah, I'm fine with that. As long as sure. you went back in. Um, yeah. I feel like it's already 12 minutes in, so maybe just send like a Facebook announcement that we weren't able to allow it to all people and that we'll post a recording. Maybe that will be easier for time. Sure. I guess that works. Too. Well, we don't have to like we don't have to start over. If we pause it, we can just let them in and then get started with what we were doing. Yeah, that was kind of my idea, but mm -hmm. okay. Since I'll go ahead and make the executive decision. I'm sorry, I don't want to kick y'all out, but I do want to let more people in. <laughs> it's okay. I'll stop the recording. <laughs> Um, so we just went over the definition of divestment, and I want to really reiterate that this is a movement and not a movement, moment, because it's really interesting to see that this does extend throughout a lot of historical periods. So I drew on a couple examples for y'all. Oh, oh, go back one. <laughs> Can you go back to the... Great, thank you. Um, so... Sorry, I just accidentally pressed my space button. You're good, you're good. Um, yeah, so this extends throughout a lot of historical periods um, throughout the world. So a couple of the prominent movements that happened in college, in colleges such as UT, is in the 70s and 80s, Stanford University did some strong protesting and advocating to get their college to divest from apartheid South Africa when that still existed, because at the time, Stanford University was heavily invested in a lot of companies that directly impacted the and perpetuated apartheid in South Africa. And there was a lot of protests about it, and eventually they were able to win, a part, um, not, to win um, divestment from that as well as a really famous example and kind of a success story is Hampshire College because Hampshire College was actually the first university in the United States to completely divest from fossil fuels. As well as divesting from fossil fuels, they also divested from apartheid South Africa, as well as divesting from Israel's occupation of Palestine. So UT's history with fossil fuels dates all the way back to the school's founding. So back in 1876, around the time that UT was founded, the Texas Constitution set aside about 2 million acres of land in West Texas. And basically, uh, those lands would be used to support UT and a and through something called the Permanent University Fund. And so the PUF is a public university endowment that provides funds to both the AM system and the UT system, but uh, mostly UT. And so the money in the PUF most, mostly comes from these 2 million acres being routinely leased to oil and gas companies, and they use the land mainly for drilling and hydraulic fracking. 
So who makes the decisions? Uh, basically, the company that manages the PUF is called UTIMCO, and that stands for UT Investment Management Company. And they operate under the authority of the UT Board of Regents. Um, to get into some success stories, because we can talk a lot about how divestment is an active movement, but we need to remember that it is possible and that's why we're fighting for it. So our lovely media campaign created this beautiful graphic that just is a map of a lot of modern day um, college divestment movements that are happening around the country. And one I really want to focus on is the University of California system, because as of 2019, the University of California system has completely divested from the fossil fuel industry in their endowment. And the UC system is like the UT system in that it's a lot of locations, campus locations, but they all operate under like the University of California. And the important thing to note here is that this did not happen overnight. This was, pro this was proposed after lots of protesting from the student body. And then um, a five-year plan was brought to the table in 2014. And through those five years, they had to wait and like actually get the plan to work. And in 2019, they actually won divestment. So when we are fighting for divestment at UT, we have to keep in mind that it's it might outlive us, it might outlive our graduation. It's really like a long haul project, but it is possible. And as you can see that um, a lot of other universities have been doing it. I included a fo photo of a protest at a Harvard Yale football game in November a couple of years ago where um, students stormed the field and sat down and kind of had like a demonstration for both of their universities to divest from fossil fuels. It's also an international movement. Um, there was recently a protest where Oxford alumni advocated for their school to divest from fossil fuels. So it really is a living movement and not just a moment in time that will pass, especially because of the fact that it's happening throughout history. Um, I will be introducing um, kind of another success story um, that is part of a, another campaign that's still ongoing. Um, it's the Columbia tuition strike. Um, it's actually um, the biggest um, tuition strike um, the U.S. has seen like ever, and also um, the biggest stri uh, tuition strike um, that the world has seen in about 50 years. Um, the first one 50 years ago um, was, I believe, the Quebec um, tuition strike, if y'all want to read up more on that. Um, very inspiring stuff. Um, and this particular campaign in Columbia um, was started by um, uh, the Columbia University chapter of the Young Democratic Socialists of America. And um, it's amazing how um, kind of this movement cohered. Um, it wasn't just YDSA that put this together. It's a coalition of different student groups that have done um, work on divestment um, and also like from other um, social justice orgs that are addressing um, the needs and surrounding community of Columbia. Um, and it also includes um, lots and lots of support of um, staff, faculty, people who work at Columbia, because um, part of their demands, um, of course, includes um, worker protections, the right to bargain for workers, um, as well as, of course, um, divestment. And um, they were recently very successful. Oh, you can press next. Um, with winning the specific uh, divestment demand. Um, Columbia, um, previously, to put a little bit more context, um, wasn't actually invested in fossil fuels to begin with. Um, but now, um, thanks to the tuition strike and a lot of the pressure that was um, built up by students, workers, uh, community members alike, they won um, sort of formalization of that divestment. Um, and yes, uh, if you look at the tweet below, um, the big old one I featured here, um, 
the divestment um, demand would not have been met without um, Section Rebellion, uh, NYC, and Sunrise Columbia. So it's also worth noting that there's years and years and years of um, organizing that has actually led up to this uh, victory. Okay. Um, before we start this Bensimeter, <laughs> I just wanted to show y'all something kind of interesting. Um, Cindy, if you're okay with uh, giving me or ending your screen share, I'll go ahead and share something real quick before we start the Mentimeter. Um, something really interesting that I actually couldn't find initially, so I didn't include the presentation, but I had to dig through the Texas Exes <laughs> website. This needs to be available on the UT website, but um, not anymore. Um, so this is just sort of a graphic of UT's budget. Um, you can see um, sort of like in this first part, um, starts with uh, the year, fiscal year 1984-1985, um, lots of state revenue was funding um, UT Austin, 5% tuition fees. So if, if you hear a professor talking about, oh, I paid like 3K um, a semester, or sorry, 3K a year um, for tuition at UT, then that's sort of the context there. Um, got research grants in other areas is like the second largest portion, 3% gifts and endowments. Um, but a lot has changed since then. We are getting a lot more money. Um, I, don't believe this is adjusted for inflation. So yeah, that's a lot of money, $2.975 billion. Um, but as you can see here, <laughs> a lot of the apportionments have changed. So we have, instead of 47% of state general revenue, UT is only getting 12%. And where does that sort of difference go into? Tuition and our fees that we pay. <laughs> and um, just wanna put that in y'all's heads. Um, also, um, the portion for research grants in other areas, as well as gifts and endowments, it's, they're very broad categories. So a lot of this um, is sort of like on the divestment side of things. Um, so these research grants in other areas, gifts and endowments could come from um, unethical companies. Um, and th that apportionment specifically has also increased. Um, so if you're kind of putting two and two together, um, divestment is a little bit more than just getting rid of, or making sure that we're not invested in unethical companies, but also really taking a look at, you know, why aren't we getting state funding when we are a public institution and that we essentially own this institution? And why are we paying this much money for tuition and fees when, again, we're a public institution, we should be publicly funded, and also, not to mention, we're students and we provide value to the institution as well as the workers at UT. Um, so why are they also getting paid um, subpar wages? Um, something to think about. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and start a new share with the, the Mentimeter, or actually, Cindy, if you want to <laughs> pull up the slides, I'll stop my sharing. So yeah, um, do you have a question on Mentimeter? Um, we'll be answering this question right here. In your opinion, what would it take to win divestment demands? And um, let me show y'all a little bit what Mentimeter is. I can pull up the right window. Um, I'll be dropping the link for y'all to access without the code um, in case y'all aren't able to access through the Mentimeter website. I think Branch just sent a link in the chat, actually. Cool. Thank you, Branch. Um, yeah, all y'all have to do is follow the link on your device. And Sydney, could you transfer over um, permissions to me? I'll go ahead and display the results as they pop up.
you're good to share. No. Thank you. Okay. Cool. So you're seeing a lot of um, lots of <laughs> so do you sort cell. Okay. <laughs> okay. Coalitions diverse, connected to frontline communities, absolutely. Yes, the same pressure from multiple angles. Definitely a strong financial case. Yes, bad press and student protests. Okay. Cool. Seeing the response kind of stop. Um, so yeah, like what I'm seeing here, I guess a general theme is to build coalitions um, across communities, across students, alumni, um, community members, and workers. Yes, absolutely. Lots of pressuring, lots and lots of holding administration accountable. Oh, Branch, feel free to jump in. You you want me to just read with some responses or? Oh, you can like give some commentary if you'd like. Oh, yes. yeah. Um, well, I think what's kind of cool about this is this is all stuff that SFCC um, tries to do, approach it from multiple angles in the different campaigns. Um, I see, you know, demonstrations with media. Um, I see um, a lot of people talking about building coalitions, which is a part of, you know, um, justice and um, a multi-year, multi-generational approach rather than, you know, one um, uh, moment. So I'll go ahead and end the Mentimeter. I mean, these responses are great and I think y'all are pretty much fried for the rest of our presentation. Thank y'all so much for participating. And honestly, if I could add one thing in there is just um, to reaffirm, I guess, sort of the democratic nature of a lot of really successful movements. I didn't really get to talk about this with the Columbia tuition strike, um, but it's also really important that, you know, we don't just have a select few figureheads who lead the movement, but um, this work belongs to all of us and we should see each other as, as leaders in this movement. Um, hope that's a little bit empowering, but yeah. <laughs> So yeah, thank you, Serena. We're, um, Sora and I are gonna talk about um, UT's investments, like the specific companies that UT, like UTIMCO is putting that oil money into in order to get their returns. So personally, I'm focusing on um, Chevron and also ExxonMobil, just cause those are kind of two of the, the big dogs in the world of like the oil companies in the US and stuff. So Utimco has actually invested in all like three of the Chevron 
companies, so Chevron Core, USA, and Texaco. And actually in the 90s, um, Chevron Texaco, so Texaco was acquired by Chevron in 2001, but Texaco spilled like 17 million gallons of crude oil into the Ecuadorian rainforest, which is a part of the Amazon rainforest. And basically, instead of taking responsibility for a lot of what they had done and the damage they had done to the people there, they just used like millions and millions of dollars to get good lawyers and they beat the people of Ecuador in a lawsuit. And so now, um, instead of helping these people recover, they're actually just um, leaving them to be permanently damaged and they're gonna go unpunished forever for it. So Ecuador sort of is dealing with a lot of crises there because of this oil spill. And Chevron Texaco is able to use money from investors like UT to be able to get away with environmental injustices like that. And then ExxonMobil, um, they were sort of one of the biggest investors in like climate change denial. So in the 1970s, whenever they were starting to kind of make the connections that greenhouse gases were causing global warming and climate change, Exxon put a bunch of research into figuring out like whether or not um, like this was an actual connection being made. And whenever they came to a conclusion, they figured out that it was a connection there. And instead of trying to change their practices, they started funneling as much money into the propaganda of climate change denial and putting in research that was trying to contradict it. And so basically they were one of the big contributors to making sure that oil companies are staying grounded in the way they are right now. And so in a way, UT's money that they're investing is able to contribute to that cause. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two more companies that UT, really UT and Co's investing in. Um, the first one is the Saudi Arabian oil company. It's a petroleum and natural gas company based out of Saudi Arabia. It's actually a publicly owned company. So like the government of Saudi Arabia runs it. Um, it's a ginormous company. Um, it's actually the seventh largest company in the entire world by revenue. So it brings in like billions and billions and billions every single year. Um, and then in terms of like market capitalization, which is kind of like the total worth of the company, the total value of the company, it's the second largest in the entire world, like over Google, over Amazon. It was like the absolute number one, um, like largest value in the entire world until like the summer when COVID hit. Um, and then Apple overtook it because like oil, the value of oil kind of like went down. Um, and then just so we like get an idea of how much oil they produce, um, in 2018, they produced 10.3 million barrels of oil per day, um, which is just a lot. Um, and then the second one is um, Sinook Limited. Um, it's an offshore crude oil and natural gas producer um, in China. Um, it's one of, it's like the largest offshore crude oil and natural gas producer in China. And then like one of the largest in, in the entire world. Um, like for that type of company. Um, they have a bunch of subsidiaries around the world. Um, one is in Canada, which caused quite the problem um, because in 2015, there was a pipeline leak in Alberta um, around Calgary, which caused like an amalgamation of like sand and oil and water. Um, 31 like million or 31,000 barrels of it, sorry, not million, um, to leak. And that's one of the largest oil spills in all of like North America's history um, in terms of like on land, not, not counting ocean. Um, but it's huge. So, um, and then I think it's also important to note the four companies that Adam and I talked about today um, are all part of like this 90, this list of 90 companies that have produced two thirds of the historical greenhouse gas emissions um, historically from 1880 to 2010. So that's, I mean, that's a lot of um, his, like greenhouse gas emissions that UT is investing in. And of the companies we also mentioned, uh, it's a part of that big list we were talking about. And all of that list is actually like public information. So if you're interested in looking at it, you can go to Utimco's website and there's a whole list of all the companies and countries that they're invested in. Okay, hey, since we're a little bit tight on time, we're gonna kind of skip this as a Mentimeter, but we'll go ahead and like ask the question right here and y'all can like um, go ahead and unmute yourself if you do have, or whenever you do have an answer, um, no pressure. Um, or they could throw it in the chat. That'd be kind yeah, of cool. Basically a Mentimeter. Yeah, yeah. 
So questions here, why do you think divestment matters? And what would it mean for you, other communities and the environment? I think for me, particularly, I remember we talked a little bit about how UT's kind of like, not their motto, but one of the things they say is that they want to transform lives for the benefit of society. And like back in the 1900s, oil was the thing that was transforming lives for the benefit of society, right? Like oil was the big new thing. And I feel like nowadays, since renewable energy just like it makes so much sense and it's so clear that it's so much better for the environment. How cool would it be if UT itself could be the ones who led that campaign of becoming a university with renewable energy and kind of like setting the example for other universities? I feel like it'd do them well. Yeah, like I totally agree. I think the biggest thing that, I mean, from like, a real standpoint, like, um, I mean, UT should be actively fostering their students' futures and stuff, and especially, like, if they're going to be teaching sustainability courses and everything like that, then they, at the same time, need to understand that funding the fossil fuel industry is actively harming um, students' futures. So it's, like, from a livability standpoint, but also just the fact that, like, our institutions are going to be so blatantly hypocritical, and then be like what y'all asking what y'all are asking for is too much and stuff and like what y'all pushing for is too much and like what you want is too much and it's like we just want to have like a stable climate and like life and stuff um i think in a personal way um divestment and just being a part of organizations like this really um kind of helped me see a future in which I feel hopeful that people will work together and build communities and actually find spaces in which their opinions are valued to um, create actual tangible change that, um, you know, doesn't just look to say this is the one solution. Um, it's all of us working together and bringing this conversation to the forefront um, and saying that there isn't one solution and that it's time to actually start working together. Awesome. These are really good responses. I'm also reading the chat and wonderful responses here too. It's really great that y'all like already acknowledge the work that um, the university is doing with regards to sustainability and, you know, because we make up the university. Um, we're kind of also in our place, um, kind of are empowered to ensure that, you know, we see more than just sustainability education, but rather, you know, what George said, practicing what we preach. Serena's point about kind of how much, like, this takes democracy and like, it's, it's, if it's a public university, it should be for the people. I mean, that's just all about what representative government is. And like, you need to hear from the people that are actually on the ground, which is us, the students and us and the faculty as well. It really should like to be reflective of a public university, it needs to put more of the public in it. But I think that should be the same for private universities as well, just kind of be in touch with the people you claim to support. Thank y'all so much. Okay, we're kind of short on time, so let's go ahead and move on. <laughs> um, so we'll just kind of do a speed round on this. Um, and if y'all don't know what Jamboard is, it's like a little like bulletin board. And um, Sydney, uh, oh, right. Hold on. Um, Y'all can access it through that QR code. Um, and I'll give y'all like five seconds to get on it um, and also preview the questions that we have. And we'll just kind of do a speed round on this. Um, so basically, once you get on the Jamboard, you'll see like there are multiple slides. Um, each slide has the question and like 
feel free to just like post like a sticky note or write down um, your initial thoughts um, on those questions. There is no order. I'll go ahead and um, like display um, the Jamboard um, in live time. Um, just a moment. I think it might be to where we can only see it and not edit it, or I just don't know how to use it. It's one or the other. Okay. Yeah, I've got it as view only as well. Interesting. Okay, I'll go ahead and, oops. See if I can load it. On oh, my computer first. <laughs> I have so many tabs open. Oh, okay. Um, if y'all, oops, let's see if it saves, okay, if y'all can refresh, it should give you permission, it should just kind of automatically do that. Let me know if you still have trouble. It's working now. Yeah, awesome. thank you. And just so um, to make the whole response thing a little bit easier, easier y'all can actually set up stickies. Sorry, this, this is a new thing that I'm actually trying to facilitate. I've only been on the opposite end of this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the easiest way is if you click the little sticky note off to the left, and then you can type out things instead of trying to write it. Sorry, I did not realize I was muted. <laughs> um, so y'all have some great responses so far. Um, and yeah, yeah, clear connection to environmental justice. Um, and it's just not a story of sustainability, but also we're thinking about the people who are suffering um, as a result of um, fossil fuel extraction. Um, and all I was saying while I was muted is like, feel free to advance the slides and answer um, the questions that are also in the presentation. Um, so if y'all see here, I do have a slide um, defining a positive demand, which is a demand that seeks to build on the foundation or a positive vision of a demand or, or a campaign. Um, and I just wanted to put this here because um, part of um, a lot of successful movements, a lot of successful campaigns, um, will have positive demands um, that really encompass like what the movement, what the campaign is really for, um, because it's not really enough to be anti-X, anti-Y. 
And this also provide um, an alternative vision um, to win people over from the event. So, yeah. So I have another question here. Given divestment's roots in environmental justice and social justice broadly, what are positive demands that relate to divestment? And what would it take to win those demands? If y'all aren't able to um, advance the slides for whatever reason, I can go ahead and, okay, cool, never mind. I'm seeing sticky notes now. Okay, third question here. What action items can you set for yourself? We'll be previewing all of that in the next slide. <laughs> Fortunately, I just wanted this to be just kind of the transition to get y'all thinking about um, yourself independently about um, what are some tasks that you can um, assign yourself um, to um, actually really participate um, in investment and just I guess in a way holding yourself accountable um, to, uh, I guess, what you wanted to see out of this presentation. Yeah. Definitely throwing money in clean, in clean energy and sustainable development projects is a really, really good um, positive demand. Yeah, I think in general, the, the act of divesting and then really taking a more uh, critical examination of what we're putting our money into as a public university that will help social justice and environmental justice more broadly. When I think about divesting in general, I think about Houston and all the minority communities that are affected by, inequitably by um, fossil fuel companies. And so divesting um, from fossil fuel companies and putting money into renewable energy projects seems to me like a, a great way to um, promote environmental justice for that reason. Absolutely. Um, so I'll go ahead. <laughs> okay, just preview of kind of what's going on in this last slide before we move on. Um, so yeah, these are really good action items. And I'll go ahead and end my screen share. And for those who do have access to the Jamboard, feel free to like go back in and add stuff whenever will be. I'll just stop my screen share and we'll move on to actual action items that we're proposing. <laughs> Um, so from the EJC side, um, you just have two simple action items. Um, if you want to learn more about EJC, the Campus Environmental Center, or you want to join us, um, reach out to us at our email, justice at utenvironment.org, or you can DM us on Instagram, Facebook, um, and we, we are just UTEJ Collective on both platforms. Um, yeah, we do have a bunch of events lined up. So um, follow us on social media to keep or stay updated. Um, an action item that kind of is within the same thing as that 
is to keep updated with SFCC social media and on the final slide, we'll have links to all of those, as well as we'd invite you to invite your friends and everyone else to like SFCC's Facebook page. We update a lot there and there's a button that you can click that actually just like invites all your friends to like a certain page. And that could really help with spreading the word and um, getting our message across. Um, we're also with SFCC, we're working on our letter drive, um, which if you came to our meetings last semester, you may have already heard about. Um, but we are still working on that, making some changes as we talk to different people. So if you'd like to get a sense of what we're working on there, you can scan the QR code and uh, look at our document there. And there will be changes coming to that so you can look out for more information. And this week, Hartzell sent out an email asking students to participate in the strategic plan survey. And the SFCC, if you follow that QR code, has a template asking for the university to uh, start a climate change uh, action plan and then you can just copy and paste that into the survey and hopefully we can get some action from the university towards divestment. Um. Well, I think that's all we have for our action items. And just from SFCC personally, I want to say thank you all for coming. And a big thank you to the Environmental Justice Collective for inviting us to collaborate on this, because this was really fun to put together. And I'm really glad that we all got to learn from this. Um, we have here some of our um, contact information if you're interested in joining either of us or keeping up to date with us. I guess I will go ahead and say my but thank y'all so much um, for being here and participating. This is a really great presentation and um, being a leader um, in the CEC and EJC under the Office of Sustainability, I'm really glad that the office is really um, wanting to talk about divestment um, in a way that you just really kind of think about our role as students, as people who um, provide value for the university. Um, just what exactly does it mean for the university to be investing um, in certain industries? All right, see you later. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. Oops.